reintroduce myself. <laughs> yeah, that was Diamond. Diamond was like, uh, you know, she gave me that, you know, hint. In case someone watching doesn't recognize the voice just yet. I mean, if you don't recognize the face, at least recognize the voice. Yes, you know, it is I, I change it not. That's, that's the Lord. It is I, but um, a different look. God bless you guys. Alrighty. So what a joy and a privilege to be part of what God is doing on the earth in these last days. Of late, the man Noah has been coming up a lot in my tuition. You know, the instructions that I've been receiving. Things that the Lord's been positioning in front of me. The name Noah, the man Noah, has been coming up again and again and again and again and again. And one of the things that strikes me about the man, his life and his dispensation was that he lived at a time wherein the earth was most troubled. Noah lived at a time wherein the earth was most troubled where men were being hunted by giants that were born to fallen angels, that were born to the watchers. A time wherein there was so much desecration, a time wherein there was so much trouble. That was when Noah was born. He lived at a time wherein the majority of people on earth had no peace whatsoever not just people animals didn't have any peace either the giant trees that existed for our ventilation had been cut down by the excessive appetite of the children of the fallen ones between the nephilim and the nephilim the earth was being overly consumed there was no hope it didn't seem like there was any it seemed like the end had come it seemed like this beautiful earth that was made for man and animals to reside in, to enjoy and to prosper in, was now being taken over by aliens who forced their way into the realm. If that is not sounding familiar just yet, then you have to think again. Look at all of what is going on in our world from alien people to alien technology things that have continually defaced the face of the earth completely defacing the earth and jesus says as it was in the days of noah so shall it be in the days of the son of man and so it is not a surprise that we're being made subject to the same turbulence if we are not being made subject to those things we should be worried we should be greatly concerned because the bible says that god says a thing and it comes to pass the Lord watches over his word to perform it. And so everything he said has to come to pass. But think about it. When Noah was born, his name means rest. There was no rest during his time, but his name means rest for many reasons. I want to point out two of those reasons to us tonight. One of those reasons being that God intends for Noah to be instrumental to what bringing rest to a restless world. Bringing rest to a troubled world. Look at the way the animals gravitated toward him. The Bible says that the earnest expectation of creation eagerly waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. Think about that scripture for a moment. It is not just the casual expectation of creation. The Bible says that the earnest expectation of creation, the most expectation that creation can muster, is eagerly waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. The moment Noah began to fulfill his purpose, the moment Noah began to answer the call to live by faith and not by sight, the moment Noah decided to defy the odds and build in accordance to the instruction of the Lord, the animals recognized that a son of God has been made manifest. They came from the north, the east, and the west, even from the south, to find this man that was doing the will of God. It wasn't magical the way they found him. They found him because it was already in accordance with the word of God 
that when we rise, when we shine, Gentiles will come to our light. Kings will come to the brightness of our shining. Do you know that God so orchestrated the arrival of Noah so that it was completely prophetic? When Jesus was to be born, the angel Gabriel made sure that the influence of heaven was very much shown in the name that he was called. After Gabriel described all of what was in the mind of God, after Mary was being intimated with the plan of God, Gabriel, the man of God, said, Gabriel said to Mary, that by the way, y'all need to call him Yahusha, which somehow became Yeshua, somehow became Jesus and Jesus. He says, you shall call his name Yahusha, for he will save his people from their sins, which literally means Yahusha. Yah means the Lord, the one that is. Husha means to save, which is where you have the word, the name Moshe from, or Moshe, which is to be drawn out, to be rescued. And so he said the name has to be called, the Lord will save. Simply because the way God operates is that whatever the Lord intends to do on the earth, he desires for man to be a part of it. He says, will I do a thing without revealing it first to my servants, the prophets? It is important for us to prophesy prophecy. What does that mean? It is important for us to declare what the Lord has declared. It is important for us. And the way God so orchestrated it was because God wanted Noah to be called a son of God. And that was the reason why when he was born, it was said that his appearance did not tally with the appearance of his parents. No one that had ever been born looked like him. He was described to have been an albino. He came and when he was born, his father Lamech, Lamech means the strong. Thank God Noah was born to Lamech and not Lazi. Lazy is what I meant to say. Because Lamech means the strong, but Lazi is lazy. It means the weak. Yeah, y'all were slow on that one. Shamra ba 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 ba. Because just imagine if he was born to a lazy man or a weak man, he would have died just looking at the boy. Because we take for granted now that, you know, we've, we've pretty much seen everything. By the time Solomon was born, what did he say? He was like, we don't see it all. He said, there is nothing new under the heavens. But by the time Noah was born, there was, it was still new. Because everything was new. And Lamech looked at the boy and he was like, uh, yeah, we need to talk to somebody about this situation. He went to his own father. And his father was like, so you think I have a clue? Where would I have seen a boy like that before? That was when they consulted with Enoch. And when they consulted with Enoch, Enoch was like, wait a minute. If I remember one of those times that I was going through the archives in heaven, he said, I came upon a story concerning the future of man upon the earth, that a child will be born and through him, rest will come upon the earth. He said, tell me again, he doesn't look like you. The guy was like, nope. He said, does it look like these ones that surround me here? He was like, absolutely, because he went to seek out Enoch where he was in the camp of the angels. And he was like, maybe not that one, but it looks more like that one. And he was like, okay, he must be the boy that I read about. And he told them that his name was Noah because he would bring rest to his people. Look at how God, by just the appearance of the boy, fulfilled or introduced us to two prophecies. That he would be called a son of God. Because they couldn't call him a son of man. Because he didn't look like man. Wow. And God intended for them to call him son of God. So that as they kept calling him. They were announcing to all of creation. That the son of God has now been made manifest. Because creation was groaning under the pain of the oppression of the fallen ones. And not only did they recognize him to be a son of God, they also recognized him to be Noah. Every time they called him, they were prophesying and speaking rest upon the earth. One more thing that we draw from the life of Noah and the story thereof is that there is nothing that we can do to have rest in the troubled world outside of the will of God. 
when you are born in such a time as this anything else that you do that is outside of the will of God anything else that you try to do on your own to bring you some kind of peace or rest may bring you some kind of pleasure but it's not going to bring you that peace that is beyond understanding because rest comes from him alone the Bible says let us give thanks to the father of the Lord Jesus Christ for whom, from whom comes all comfort every kind of peace and rest comes from him Jesus says in the world you will have tribulations and trials he says but in me you have peace come unto me all of you who are labored and heavy laden and I will give you rest I tell you what folks if you would have peace in these times that we're in you have to be a Noah you have to be someone who knows how to rest in God because the troubled ones are not looking for another troubled one the people that have been troubled in the world are not looking for another person who is troubled in the Lord if you are in the Lord be at peace do not claim to be in the Lord and still be troubled it has to be said of your demeanor that you are a child of God. From your demeanor, from the way you look in the face of trouble, we need to be able to say that's a child of God. From the way Noah looked when he was born, he was called a child of God. From the way you comport yourself, you should be someone that is found to be at rest all the time so that demons will be the ones to wear out of your presence to the ends of the earth. When they have their meetings, they need to be able to speak concerning you and say, have you seen Manda Lita lately? We have danced around her. We have tried everything possible and she's not bothered. She's at rest in the midst of the storm. That is when the falcons will hear of it and say to one another, another child of God has been spotted. One who is at rest. We need to find them because wherever they are is where the ark is. We have come to such a time, folks, wherein God has selected you to be a part of the new thing that he's doing upon the earth. As it was in the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, God could have tossed an ark out of heaven. He could have. He could have just built himself an ark and tossed it down. When the Lord started drawing my attention to the story of Noah again, I said, Lord, you could have made all things new all by yourself. I said, because there was no Noah when you made everything. He said to me, he says, what's the fun in that? He says, do you know how many times I've done that in eternity? He said, I came here and instituted time and made man so that I can do it with you. God chose that everything that would happen within time will have the involvement of man because what is the point of setting up a system to raise children and then you do things without those children? Our homes are supposed to be institutions for raising children. And yet many people try to live in their homes without involving their children in the running of the home. They just know that dishes are clean. They don't know how it happens. They just know that their clothes are washed and hung. They don't know how it happens. They just know that food appears on the table. They don't know how it happens. They just know that, okay, we're going to the Bahamas for vacation. They don't know how it happens. They're not part of the decision making. What is the fun in that? That is not the will of God. Your heavenly father does not run the earth like that. He runs the earth with your involvement. He doesn't do a thing without telling you. Everything that God expects you to partner with him on, he can do by himself and he has already done by himself. He made the earth and he looked after his own earth until he handed off the reins to Adam. And so the reason why he has put you here is so that you are a part of making everything new. But God does not do things recklessly nor restlessly. So God is only going to work with people who are at rest. God is trying to make the, the whole system new. The last, thing, the last thing he needs are crybabies who are agitated, who are pacing back and forth. 
And God is like, Justin, can you sit down? I'm trying to think here. And you're pacing back and forth. And God is like, why exactly are you pacing back and forth? Have I not given you my word? And is my word not eternally settled in heaven? What is it that you are concerned about that I have not already taken care of? You know, because worry is one of the most frightening forms of unbelief. It's one of the ways by which we deny God on a daily basis. Because if you truly believe that he's for you and not against you, then why are you concerned about what you will eat and what you will drink? Jesus says, have you seen a sheep ever that worries about what grass it would eat? You don't see them crying and saying, oh, we don't know what this spring is going to look like. He says, if your heavenly father looks after them the way he does, he says, are you not of many, are you not of more value than many sparrows? You are worth more than a thousand times a thousand sheep. We need to be at rest in order for God to be able to work with us. The Bible says that shall two walk together unless they be in agreement. Do you know that until the Lord started to show me about Noah, what his name means, what his life was about, how he was not agitated, even though everything around him was looking chaotic. When the Lord started to show me that was when I began to understand a lot more about the way John kept introducing Jesus before he said he was the one coming to make all things new. He called him the Prince of Peace. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he has appointed us kings and priests unto our God. But we keep running elter skelter like beggars. We keep losing our cool as a people without authority. People who have authority don't get restless. They just speak. The centurion said, when Jesus said, I will come to your house, it was like, to be honest, if you ask me, that is doing too much, sir, with all due respect. He said, because you don't have to. He says, I am a man under authority, and I know that I don't have to go everywhere. He said, I am a man under authority. I say to this one, go, and he goes. I say to that one, come, and he comes. He says, and to the servant that is in my house, I say, do this, and he does it. And so why are we not living as people under authority? You want to be the one to go. No, you are supposed to say to this one, go, and he goes. Has he not given his angels to be ministering spirits to those of you who are heirs of salvation together with Christ Jesus? God has a lot that he wants to bring out of this system, of this earth, of this place. A lot of things that have been hidden from eternity past that is part of his strategy to make all things new. But he's looking for the men and the women who will recognize that they are the rest that the earth needs. That they are the ones that he has chosen to work with to make all things new. But where are we? We're in agitation. When the Lord is inviting us to come for holy deliberation. He's saying, come and let us reason together. He says, I know the things that would normally bother you. He says, I've taken care of them. The Lord says, come and let us reason together. If your sins were as red as scarlet, he says, they can become white as snow. He said, whatever it is that is bothering you, I can take care of them. What the Lord was saying, because sin is the state of being falling short of the glory of God. And God is saying, if there is any area of your life wherein you are falling short, to the point wherein it has become a bloody mess, red as scarlet, God says, we can fix that. This is where we fix it. Not in your thoughts. Not in your worry. Not out there running the streets. This is where we fix it. Because until you are at rest, creation will not come to you because they're already troubled enough. You understand what I mean? Because what you have is what you give. Rest is what they need. Rest is what you should have. Because if you do not have rest, creation is already troubled enough. They're not going to come to you so that you can multiply their sorrow. No thanks. The devil can do that for them. Even better than you could. So why don't we be the people of rest? When Jesus says, come unto me, all of you who are labored and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
And after he said that, he says, I am going to my father. And the question is, uh, but you said people should come to you. But now you are going. He says, yeah. He said, because you are here. Occupy it till I come. He said to Peter, they will come to you when they come feed them. Tend them. As I have delivered you, deliver them. As I have casted demons and doubts out of you, cast demons and doubts out of them. But when they come and they find you worrying, how does that glorify your father which is in heaven? God is not calling us to continue to perfect ourselves in bodily exercises. He's calling us unto godliness because bodily exercises profit little, but godliness is profitable. What does godliness mean? Godliness means to have a character that is like God's. To be calm. To be able to sleep through the storm. To be able to love at all times. To be like God with whom all things are possible. That is your mindset. That is the mindset of your heavenly father. Because the moment you begin to entertain the thoughts of impossibility, then you lose your peace because your heavenly father is never in impossibility. He's always in possibilities. And wherever he is, that is where his peace resides. So if all things are going to be made new, if that which the Lord intends to do upon the earth is going to happen, it would have to happen with people in partnership with God who have learned not to lose their peace. One of the things that I shared with you on Saturday was about the man called Blind Bartimaeus. After the Lord Jesus asked him, what may I do for you? He says that I may see. And the Lord Jesus said to him, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. Do you know that many times we read that and we miss the go your way part? You see, I'm going to relate that to the story of Noah, but I want us to understand the concept of what it means to tell a man that has never seen to go his way. Let's think about it for a second. He has never gone his way. He's always had to go the way of another because someone else has always had to lead him. It is everybody else's way but his. And so when the Lord Jesus said to him, Arise, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. It makes sense for us to understand the dynamics of what Jesus was telling him because every single one of us is blind Bartimaeus. Because we haven't seen all of what our Heavenly Father has for us. We haven't seen it. And until we see it, we cannot walk in it. And the reason why Jesus says, go your way, your faith has made you all, is because even though the man had never seen with his physical eyes, his faith was already plotting a destiny of peace. And Jesus was saying, now you can go your way. You see that way that your faith has been able to produce even when you did not have the natural abilities you had faith even when it hadn't come to the realm where you are being tortured and tormented where you are suffering you had faith now i am letting you walk in the fullness of what you have seen do you know that every time they call noah noah they call him rest it affords him the privilege of having burst visions to a time wherein he will truly be at rest. You see, because a man who is born into chaos, who is always called rest, rest is always announced over him. And do you know the beauty of words is that we see the things that we say. The moment I say to you, I want you to not imagine a white elephant. Yeah. So if I say imagine a white elephant, you imagine a white elephant. If I say don't imagine a white elephant, you still imagine a white elephant because words create images. They create pictures. 
So basically, regardless of the negativity, regardless of the intention behind it, as long as the word is being spoken, you see it. So whether the people of his time were ridiculing him by saying, <laughs> rest. In the midst of all of this, <laughs> rest indeed. People would have said to him at school, rest my food. Rest all kinds of other rests. Because it doesn't make any sense for you to be called rest. And that was how he was raised. He was raised to see what others were not seeing. And that was the reason why the Lord said to him that rain was coming. It was like, oops, we, got, we, we better build. Because he was able to conceive of the impossible because all of his life he has had to live in another reality outside of the one that he was born into. If the Lord says to you today, go your way, do you know which way you are going? Do you have a way that you have plotted for yourself? A way that is based on possibilities, not on circumstances. A way that is based on what God has said as opposed to the things that people have said to you. A way that is based on the grace and the mercy of God as opposed to the limitations of your inabilities. Are we forging for ourselves the reality of promises as opposed to just hoping to wade through reality? God is calling us to come up higher. He's looking for laborers to go into the field. He's looking for partners to put their hands on the plow to work with him. However, majority of us are busy trying to solve our own problems that God has already taken care of. And we're expending precious time on finished work rather than coming to do the work that needs to be done. Everything that we occupy ourselves with often is already finished work. And someone says, Brother Moses, it's easy to say that it's a finished work. But I'm the one receiving the phone calls. I'm the ones receiving the mails. As long as you keep thinking you are the one receiving the phone calls and the mails, the burden is going to be on you. Because you're taking the place of God. Let me tell you something. Your mailman is never worried about the letters that you're getting. If they send you an eviction notice and it's delivered by your mailman, he goes home and he sleeps because it's not his problem. Why is that? Because he knows he's just an errand person. A pass through. This message is just passing through me. He's not coming to me. And so why are your bills stopping at your heart when they could easily pass through to God's heart? When you are simply the male man or woman delivering the challenges to the one who sent you. When God said to Noah, build the ark. He didn't say, okay, I need two more jobs. So that I can afford the wood and the labor. You understand what I mean? The Lord says build an ark and the man was like, where's the plan? And God was like, okay, there's the plan. was like, okay, you got it. Did we ever hear him run out of gopher wood? Do you know, let me tell you a fun fact. Gopher wood that the ark was built with grows in only one place in all of the earth. And it's in Florida. Yeah, I know. Of all places. The last thing you want to do in Florida is cut down wood and build an ark when you can be on a, on a beach somewhere. Let me tell you something. This is a fun fact. You can go and research it yourself. The Bible says, and Noah built for the Lord and built for himself an ark of gopher wood. Gopher wood, the tree grows in only one place in the world. If you find it growing somewhere else, wake up, you're dreaming. If you find it growing somewhere else, it's sci-fi movie. But the reality of it is it grows in only one place. When I found out, I asked the Lord, I said, hmm, that's interesting. Why only one place? And the Lord said to me, it's because the reality of it is all of your provisions have only one source. And that is me. He said, if it grows in different places, then no one may start to think of which one is more economical to go and get. 
he may he may have many options and then he, we, he wears himself out trying to figure out which ones to go to he said but when there is only one place he just goes where my word leads let me tell you something something as rare and as scarce as gopher wood became abundantly available to noah because heaven had a need if you think you have a need you would have to meet the need your job is to remind heaven that they have a need your womb is closed and you're worrying you're wondering you're not the one who needs a child god is the one who needs people He's the one who said, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the surface of the old earth. I didn't even know that I wanted a child. I didn't even know that there was any benefit to that. When I was two years old, when I was... And so just imagine before I was born, if I existed somewhere else, do you think the, the first thing on my mind is to have a child? No, I came here and that became a thing. So whoever brought me here wants more people here. So, hello, do your thing. So if you're sitting there thinking you have to make it happen, then you have to make it happen because as you are thinking, you have to be plotting and you have to make it happen. But if you recognize that your responsibility is to remind heaven that, you know, when you made women, you said they should have children. Hey, hello, I'm a woman here. I don't just want to bear the burden of being a woman. I want to enjoy the blessing of being a woman. So heaven, you have a need. And when heaven has a need, Heaven meets heaven's needs. You want to be at rest? This is how to be at rest. To begin to recognize that most of us will live our lives more complicated than heaven intends for it to be. You know one of the things that the Lord pointed out to me that I've shared with you before? Is that many of us will find it difficult to let go. We just find it difficult to let go. Simply because we are afraid of what will happen if certain things do not happen. And you know what? One of the things that the Lord does to rescue us from having those fears is to allow those things to happen. So that when they happen and you survive it, you're like, oh, that wasn't so bad. And God was like, yeah, when I made all things, I said, behold, it is all good. It was the deception in you by sin that was convincing you that that would be the end of the world. Yeah. You keep thinking, oh, what if I lose this thing? Oh my God, what am I going to do? Let me tell you something. Anything that you worry about losing has taken the place of God in your life. Because the Bible says that a man's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he owns. Your sufficiency comes from the one who is called the I am. I am your peace. I am your friend. I am your joy. I am your divine provider. I am your everything. And so if he is the I am of everything that you need, then why are you afraid of losing anything? The bottom line is God wants us to be at peace. We're going to read three scriptures very quickly. One from 2 Corinthians and two from 2 Corinthians. And when we look at these things, I want you to just let your heart present as much faith as you can muster. So the first one is 1 Corinthians. We're going to read chapter 1. And I believe it's verse 13. In fact, before we go into that, just, just keep, your marker, keep your marker there. The Lord said to me that I'm not done explaining what it means to let go. I'm going to tell you a story that I told you once before. When I was in my first year at the university, I saw myself in a dream going up a staircase. So the hostel that I was staying at was kind of like in a valley. It was nested in, you know, among woods. It was almost like a very wooded area. So you have to go down a, a flight of stairs to the level where my hostel was. So this was back in Nigeria. So because it's very hot, the Germans built that facility. And so because it's usually very hot, what they did was they found sort of like a gully between two high areas and they nested the hostel there so that you're surrounded by trees and you get the cool breeze. Because in case you forgot, Hot air rises and cool air falls. So the entire hostel did not need air conditioning because of 
the density of the cool air that comes in there. So it's a beautiful place to go into. And in the dream, I saw myself trying to come up from there. And as I was climbing up, I didn't look like my usual self. I looked more like, um, the way I would describe my look at the time would be sort of like an Arabian wrestler. If you've seen those Arabian movies and now the wrestlers just tied something around their waist, belly covered up, and they would have met, I mean, leather bands around their hands and the long ponytail. That was what I looked like, but I knew that was me. When I saw that being going up and it looked like it was maybe 15 to 18 feet tall. It was a huge being that could have just taken one stride over the staircase and be done with. But he was struggling to climb up the stairs. And a strong wind, boisterous, came against this fellow. And as he was trying to climb, I was feeling the pain in my chest. Now what is this? Why is this so difficult? I should just climb over this thing and be done with. And have it over with. But guess what? I continued to struggle. And I was there, resisting the wind. And eventually I felt like I couldn't anymore. And halfway through, I saw myself tumbling down back into the valley and I heard the breaking of pottery. You know the way when you break a plate, the way it sounds, that was what I heard. My heart was shattered. I went for weeks not being able to locate my joy or peace. I felt very dejected. I started to think about all of what that could mean. The first thing that I was willing to accept was that maybe I wasn't going to finish in this school. Maybe this staircase represents the journey of my academics and it's going to be cut short. I was thinking to myself, I can live with that. And then another thought came and said, what if that is the journey of your calling, your walk with God? Can you live with that also? And then my mood went even further down. I would try to pray, but I would, wouldn't be able to get words out. My heart was heavy. And so guess what happened? The Lord came to my aid. After a couple of weeks, maybe about two months, I had another dream. And this other dream started with me seeing pieces. They looked like blocks from an uncompleted building, just boulders all over a place. And without being told, I immediately felt a connection to the pieces that I was seeing. And it looked like those were the pieces of me. And then I remembered the other dream. I was like, oh, the shattering sound that I heard. This is what it resulted in. And you know when you've been heartbroken for a while and you thought your heart could not be even more broken? My heart sunk within me. Because what I was looking at looked like a very hopeless situation. And suddenly, I was lifted up in that vision. And the big boulder started becoming smaller and smaller and smaller until I got to a particular height where they looked like little pieces of a broken vessel. And that was when I noticed that the surface that they were on had the profile of a man's hand. And when I saw that, the hand started to come together and it closed up on all the pieces. And when it opened up, I saw that same man that was trying to climb the stairs put back together again and the Lord said to me he says you didn't have to have held on and struggled he says because it was not my intention for you to climb it was my intention for you to rest in me I will put you together again and my promise is to set you upon your high places you know the Lord did not say you would have to sweat and climb your high places he says I will set you upon your high places I came out of that vision with my strength renewed, with my hope restored. And from that moment up until the next great big challenges came that God prepared to elevate me to another level, until that season came for the rest of that other season, there was nothing that I found difficult to let go of. A year after that, I helped somebody to set up a business. And we didn't think, or at least he didn't think the business was going to flourish. This was my second year. And the business started to flourish, started to grow, started to expand. And after a while, himself and his wife came together and decided to buy me out quickly before it grew too much to the point where they may not want to pay me. 
And when the guy called me to his office, he didn't know how to say it. He was pacing back and forth. He was like, I'm really sorry. This was not the way I wanted it. You know, but my wife and I, and you know when people say my wife and I, sometimes they're like, okay. Say no more. And it was like the other person that was our silent investor. We, we offered him a package to buy him out. So I said to him, I said, sir, are you saying you don't want me to be one of your partners anymore and you're offering to buy me out? He was like, yeah. I said, let's do it. Let's do it now. The guy was like, you're not mad. I said, no, I'm not mad. I said, because if you want it, you can keep it. And he was like, um, I said, but I'm going to take my computer from the office. Is that okay? That's not part of the deal because I've got code on it. I, he said, you can have your computer. And then they bought me out of the business. I would have been there fighting. When the man was talking, I remember the guy that was holding onto the railings of the stairway, trying to climb up on his own. I struggled for nothing. I could have just let go and let the Lord put me back together again and then take me where he wants me to be. I let go very quickly. And you know what happened? All of what I could have struggled to get out of that business was brought to me on the platter of gold. About six months or so after that incident, I was riding in the car with my father and his driver. I sat in the front, he was in the back, and he tapped me on the shoulder. He said, we're restructuring at the bank. He says, I may not be there for much longer. He says, if they offer me an early retirement, which was interesting because it was part of the people who put the package together. So he was like, if everything goes through, he said, I'll be done at the bank. He said, but I'm still young. I will need something to do. At that point, I thought to myself, what has that got to do with me? I'm not a banker. I hate bookkeeping. So don't talk to me about banking. And so I was like, wow, that's good. Well, that's, that'll be awesome. I'm happy for you. He said to me, he said, he said, I heard you helped someone start a business the other day. And I'm like, uh, you did? Because I didn't want him to know because I took a leave of absence from school to do that. And I didn't tell anyone at home. So please don't do this at home. I did this because of a lot of issues and also because I was led. And so I was like, wow, you did? He says, I found out. He said, and I heard that it was a success. He says, I'm thinking maybe we can do that again. I said, oh, yeah, let me think about it. Another six months came and he called me. He says, my retirement is effective. I'm, I'm at home already. Extended leave that will become retirement. Let's do this. My father paid for everything that was needed to set up the internet service business that I helped the other guy set up such that we started from where those guys were. We started day one from the level where they were at. And in no time, we began to grow. And I didn't have to beg. I didn't have to sweat. The Lord brought it. But let me tell you something. It was so hard to let go in that vision. It was so hard to let go of a lot of things that I was struggling with at the time. But the hardest thing to do is to try to hold on. It is easier to let go. Jesus put it this way. He says, my burden is light. My yoke is easy. It is easier for you to surrender. It is easier for you to let him take care of you. If there is anything that you're struggling to keep, go to God. I say, God, do we need this thing? Because if we need it, then you keep it. Jesus did not try to keep the disciples. He went to the Father. He says, Father, keep them for me. So why are you trying to keep things for him? when he wants to keep them for you. He wants to help you keep that opportunity for business. If that's what you truly need, he can help you keep it. He wants to help you keep your children in line. He wants to help you keep your mind at rest. We just need to learn how to press into his mind. Someone says, will this mindset not make people lazy? Contrary. On the contrary, it makes people more productive. You see, because when your mind is at rest, you get more done. A lot of what keeps us busy when we're restless is just worry, making us pace back and forth. When your mind is clear, you have that vision of the head of Goliath. You don't miss. 
But when you occupy yourself with things that you think can save you, David says, I can't move in this armor. I can't even see with this helmet. So you know what, Mr. Saul? Thank you for all your self-help. But I don't need it. Because I want to be able to move freely. Because it's not this helmet and this armor that will protect me. It is the Lord and is invisible. So it may not look like I've got security, but I do. It may not look like I've got the tools that I need, but I do. So what do I do? I step out without allowing anything to get between me and the equipping of heaven. I bring you the word of the Lord today. It is time for you to rest. You are is Noah. You are the partner that he has chosen to build with this new world. We're building back better. And it's not the president doing it. It is the Lord. Jesus says, behold, I am coming. My reward is with me and I make all things new. But the partners that I have chosen, I want to see them ready to deliver. Quit worrying, start winning. First Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to read chapter 1, verse 13. And look at what it says. It says, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Was it Paul that was crucified for you? So why do you want to be crucified for yourself? The Lord is reminding you that it was the Lord Jesus who was crucified for you and he has already paid that price. Stop trying to die trying. That is the mantra of the world. The world says, you know, you have to die trying. No, I don't have to die trying. I want to live because Jesus already died. I need to recognize that that same Jesus who died is still the same Jesus that is in my heart. He's the one that I am in. There was not a particular point in time wherein they divided Jesus and said, so this is the Jesus that died for the world and this is the Jesus you have to die for. He is not divided. Stop trying to die for yourself. Tell yourself, I will not die, but live to declare the works of God. Peace has to be the ambience of your soul. Now, 2 Corinthians. We're going to read chapter 2. 2 Corinthians. I just was in Corinthians. Where did my Corinthians go? Yeah, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going to read from verse 14. 2 Corinthians 2, 14. And then 2 Corinthians 3. We're going to read 2 Corinthians 3 after this one. He says, Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. The Bible says God always leads you where? In triumph in Christ. So if you put your trust in self, it becomes difficult for God to lead you in triumph. But it leads you in triumph when you are in Christ. When you are rested in the Messiah. To be in the Messiah means to accept his assignment. You accept him as the deliverer. You accept him as the savior. So when the Lord finds you that your mind is at rest in the savior, then guess what? He then takes it on from there and leads you into triumph. Let me tell you something, we need to learn how to lose things and be okay with it. When everything was taken away from Job, <laughs> he says, blessed be the Lord, for the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Oh yeah. And guess what? The Lord took away his worry. Even though he was the wealthiest man in the, in the east, the Bible says that he cannot eat his food in peace because he was always fasting, afraid. He says, I'm going to fast today just in case my children curse the Lord in their hearts. Can you even imagine what things he was worrying about? He was worrying about children who are not God's grandchildren. They are also God's children. There's a direct link between every man and God. God ain't got no grandchildren. He was not, he was not worrying over his children like they are his children. You ain't got nothing. Everything belongs to God. So when you recognize that you will be at peace and then you will start to think clearly. You will start to operate in the wisdom with which to guide them on God's behalf. You are simply a custodian. You do not own anything. 
How can you claim ownership of a whole human being? That's why some parents struggle when their children are 18 or older and it's time for them to go. They're like, oh, I don't want him to go. I want to follow him to college. No, 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 no. That child is God's child. Do your best right now. You know, that's why one of the reasons why some people do not like my wife and I. They're like, when, when we said we were no longer coming to communion house, you didn't even call us. When you saw that we stopped coming, you didn't even come looking for us. I'm like, what else? If I'm coming to look for you, then that means I did not do the best that I can while you were here. If I've already given my all while you were here and it's not okay for you and you get angry and you stop coming, I have nothing else to give. Don't you get it? When you were here, I gave you my all. I prayed for you. I fasted for you. I counseled you. I made myself available for you. We raised offerings for you. And so if that is not enough for you, go somewhere else. Let's be clear. You are not my member. We are all members of the body of Christ. Was he Paul who died for you? Was it Moses Anderson who was crucified for you? Is it Rosemary that was crucified for you? No, it was the Lord Jesus who was crucified for you. And so if you're not happy being here at Communion House because you don't like my face, then go somewhere. Maybe you'll find a face that you like. I don't have to come chasing after you. Jesus says when you preach the gospel to them and they do not listen, dust this, this, your sandals and keep moving. But because the world system has raised people in idolatry, pastors want to be idolized and members also want to be idolized. I don't want to be idolized. Don't worship me. I am just your brother. Yeah, absolutely. But people have been raised to become idols. Children have become idols to their parents. And that is the reason why when they're leaving, their parents feel like their God is about to leave. No, 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 no. You can leave. You see, the principle behind it is why you were here, while I was changing your diapers, I was prophesying over you. You understand what I mean? While you were messing my living room, I was prophesying over you. I was setting you straight in the way that you should go. So the moment it's time for you to go, what do I say to you? I say to you what Jesus said to blind Bartimaeus, go your way. And so if the way that you want to go into is the way of, of, of sentiment, a way of being disgruntled, it is the way that you forged for yourself in your heart. But if you mean well, you'll be happy to go well. If you mean well, you'll be happy to say, hey, Brother Moses, the Lord is calling us. We're going from here to do. If you are not confident enough to announce where you're going, you are not like Christ. Jesus says, I am going to be with my father. Paul says, I am going to Antioch. Peter said, I am going to the Jews. If you are not confident to say, that means there is shame involved. And shame is a symptom of sin. Stop bad behavior. The other day, one man who has given place to the devil in his life, Started to complain about me simply because he told me, he said, he says, I have decided to move on. I've removed myself from all of the groups on WhatsApp. And I said, wow, it's been a pleasure doing life with you. He was mad as heck because I didn't beg him. Why should I plead with you? Are you the I am? Whatever you were to me is because the Lord allowed you to. And now that you've removed yourself from the equation, the Lord will be to me more than you could ever be. You see, it is bad behavior. It is idolatry. If I have done the best that I can, so what else, what am I calling you for? To give me a second chance? No, I did not waste my first chance. No, no, the Bible says, whatever your hand finds to do, do with all your heart. I do not. Let me tell you something. Why should I stand here in my place of service to other men and allow another man who has never held a meeting in his house or in the public place to make me feel bad. You've been a believer for 17 years. No one has enjoyed fellowship in your name. You have not been a servant of anybody else. And we are in the revival of Obedidom. And you want to make me feel bad? Let me tell you something. Stop letting people who are not doing what you are doing tell you you are not doing well. Talk is cheap. I want to see you run a meeting in your house. Or in a rented space for six months successfully. Once you do that, come and talk to me. And then I will tell you, do it for five more years. Before you can talk to me. 
Yeah, it is. Let me tell you something. False humility has allowed for us to has allowed for us to, to, to release some people onto pride. Because we were being humble. I don't want to say nothing. And now they're feeling so confident. No, 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 no. You cannot tell me that because you left and I didn't come looking after you, I'm not doing well. Why did you leave? Did you leave well? Did you leave right? And when you were here, were you right? And now that you're gone, are you being right? Show me your fruit. When John the Baptist was trying to make Jesus feel bad, Jesus was like, what are you talking about? He says, can you not see the blind sea and the lame walk? I am doing the work of him who has sent me. Against all odds, we continue to have meeting after meeting, fellowship after fellowship. We continue to pray. We continue to do what God has asked us to do. You have made complaining about everybody else your ministry. You will have your reward. You understand what I mean? When you have done what you're supposed to do, you don't idolize anybody. You don't hold on to anybody. You don't go begging for a second chance. Jesus told his disciples, if they didn't get it the first time, keep moving. If Jesus didn't say to his disciples, well, maybe you go to, a, 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 go to an inn and rest for like a day, maybe tomorrow they will listen to you. Jesus says, if you enter a place and they do not receive you, he says, come out from that place, dust your sandals and don't look back. Because there is a lot of work to do why should I now sit with people looking for a babysitter? I am not your babysitter. If you can't grow up under this teaching, oh. No, you, then get up and go. Let somebody else who will grow come and take the seat. Someone sat under my teaching for three years and some. And when he was leaving, he was like, oh, I believe it's time for us to go so that others can come. I said, blessed be the name of the Lord because I cannot continue to water you with that which the Lord has sent me with and I don't see growth in you and when you're leaving I should not follow you to come and waste more time no not today not ever when Judas was intent on betraying Jesus Jesus said to him what you must do do quickly the other day, I noticed somebody was beginning to show signs of wanting to become trouble. And I helped him to leave very quickly. And I had so much peace. I was so happy. I said, now I am becoming more like Christ. I used to want to indulge people until they mess all around me. I said, no, what you must do, do it quickly. Simply because if you allow the wrong people to be in the right place, they will take the peace of those that God has assigned. So it's better for them to be on their way speedily. Don't worry, we are coming to the season of reward. We will all see. Second Corinthians. Did we read one Second Corinthians already? No, no, we did. We read Second Corinthians 3. Did we read Second Corinthians 3.12? We read 2 something, right? Second Corinthians 2 was what we read. What we read. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, we read what? Oh, yeah. And then we read again from 2 Corinthians 2.14. God causes you to triumph. Then the next one is 3.12. 2 Corinthians 3.12. And look at what it says. It's therefore, it says, therefore, since we have hope, we use great boldness of speech. Someone is like, I've never seen Pastor Moses sound so aggressive. Uh, it's not aggression, it's boldness. And it's long overdue. You know I've cut my locks now, so you have nothing to pull. So I'm coming all out now. <laughs> it's on. <laughs> the Bible says that therefore, since we have such hope, what is the meaning of such hope? Do you know the kind of hope that I have? The hope that I have is that I know that God is not unrighteous to forget my labor of love. That is the reason why I speak with boldness. I have hope that my children will do well. Why? Because I have seized the grace of God that was given to my wife and I. We have seized that grace to train them in the way that they should go. And so now I have the boldness to say to them when the time comes, go your way. If somebody says they want to leave communion house, I have the boldness to say, 
It's been a pleasure. Now, vit vit, go your way and do it quickly. You know why? Because I have such a hope that God will not, God is not unrighteous to forget my labor of love. I have rest in him. Simply because I know that faithful is he who has promised who will also do it. But if I've been holding back, I will be agitated. If I've been doing it in my own ability, I will be frustrated. You know, if I've been trying to please people by my own ability and having sleepless nights, when they say they're leaving, I'll be even more frustrated because I'm like, oh, what else should, should I do? But because I serve from a place of rest, confident that it is he who has promised who will also do it. When you say you're leaving, I say go. Because I have such hope that makes me bold. So if you are not telling us boldly of what God is asking you to do and you leave just because some housewives have given place to the devil and filled your heart with nonsense. If that is the reason why, that is the reason why you are not bold because you don't have hope. Let me tell you something. I heard the Lord say to me earlier today. He says, look at them. They have chosen gossip over worship. Oh yeah, because there are people that I know that the Lord has called to worship and they have abandoned their place. Since you left and followed gossip, have you been worshiping? You know, don't, I know you're watching because you're still spying on us. Since you left worship for gossip, have you been doing the will of God? You know. Let me tell you something. I was in a meeting today and I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, he says you are a watchman. If you don't warn them, their blood will be on your hands. I'm like, ah, I thought I was trying. He says, you, you can warn a little more. And he said to me, you need to speak a little more boldly. And that's what we've just read. I am speaking with boldly because I have such a hope that if I do my work, the Lord will save souls. People will grow. Men will be strong. Women will be fruitful. Children will be raised. If we, that is the hope that we have. And that is not the reason, and that is the reason why we're not going to entertain the people who have given up their ambition for Satan's agenda. Take a screenshot where you're at. You see this new look? It's not your mate. This new look, hallelujah. And let me tell you something. Because bad people will cost you good people if you do not march them out. And so I say to you that in the mighty name of Jesus, if an opportunity arises for you to repent, seize it. Because we have a hope that we will reap what we have sown. And you also will reap what you are sowing. So if you are sowing discord amongst brethren, you will reap a separation from Christ when it matters. So why don't you become an Obed Edom, a person who chooses to serve other people. We are here serving other people. At every expense, at many, at much expense, by the grace of God. But we're not taking credit because even when we say at much expense, is, is it our own abilities or the grace of God? So it is a privilege that we have been given to be part of those that will make all things new. To be part of what God is doing as it did in the days of Noah. And so what did God say to Noah in Genesis chapter 7? God said to Noah, my friend, gather your family and go into the ark. Because rest is for you and your household. We have to be at rest because God has work for us. So all those people that want to occupy our time with foolishness, we say no. Because the Bible says, do not cast your pearl before swine and do not give precious things or holy things to dogs. Because after they have eaten from your hand, they will bite you. These were the words of the Lord to Noah in the generation of his days. The people of his days were evildoers. But he could not afford to be distracted because there is an ark to build. He put out the miscreants like Tubal Cain, who was trying to get in the way of the work. They threw him out because of the fact that there are innocent birds and lamb and lions, creation that are looking for a place 
of safety. And the Lord has said to us that he has planted us upon a high place so that we can grow and have branches that the wandering birds can come and nest in. So why should we then allow ourselves to be eaten by weevils when God has a divine assignment for us? As for us, we will be at peace. We will be well rested because the morning cometh and we have work to do. The five wise virgins said to the foolish virgins, go and buy your own oil. We're not going to let you drain us dry because at the end of the day, if we allow that, you are already empty and if we also become dry, who will the bridegroom find when he comes? So be on your way very quickly, please. In fact, that's the door quickly. Go and buy oil. Go, go and get your own. As for us, we will, man, we will maintain the one that we have. And the Bible says as soon as the foolish ones left, they trimmed their weak. They trimmed it. And you know what it means to trim one's weak? Is to recognize that a posture of rest is required to be preserved until the Lord comes. Be at peace, my friends. God has divine assignments for you. Do not worry about what everybody else worries about. When the need comes, phone home. Tell your Heavenly Father, they just sent us another bill. You got that one? All righty, now that I've told you, I am going to sleep. I'm going to go read the book of Matthew. I'm just going to go read about how Jesus was meeting everybody's needs just to remind me that he's still in the business because Christ is not divided. I'm still in the dispensation of the good shepherd and it's never over. Let us break bread. Amen. Colossians chapter 2. We're going to break bread from Colossians 2 7. How many people want to make that their favorite scripture at least until tomorrow? 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 12. Because we have such hope, we speak boldly. And so you know yourself also, the one that comes to spy on our videos and continue to snitch on us that we're still having meetings. Shame on you. Because you cannot stop this work. If this work started, was started by man, it would have ended a long time ago. We have such hope that faithful is he who has begun a good work. Who will also bring it to a perfect completion. Do not fight God. No one has ever fought him and defeated him. He is undefeatable. Let me tell you something. I am so blessed by God to be a man of many talents. A man that has a wealth of experience in businesses. I, there are a million and one things out there that I could be doing. But I'm here because this is what the Lord is doing. And I want to be on the same table with him. I, I, want, to be, I want to be next to him because I'm his co-laborer. And so I'm not doing this and asking for God's help. No, God is doing this and I'm just happy to be a part of it. And so if you think you're trying to stop man, you are trying to stop God. You better stop before you are stopped. Because he is a rock of offense. And the Bible says the one that he collides with, that collides with him, he grinds into powder. We have been too gentle. And that is the reason why some people think they can just come and dance around us. No, 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 no. We have trimmed our wick. Come around and be burned. Colossians chapter 2 verse 7. Another dangerous scripture. He says rooted and built up in him. And established in the faith. I am rooted and established in Christ. I am established in faith. Communion house is rooted. Colossians chapter 2 verse 7. Colossians chapter 2 verse 7. Rooted and built up in him and established. We are rooted, we are built, we are established. That is the hope that we have. That we are immovable, we are unshakable. We are fruit bearers because we are the planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. And you know the reason why we have to address this to people? Sometimes, it's not because we have forgotten that it is evil spirits that is behind these operations. But if those evil spirits have chosen to reside in those people, they will hear those messages with those two ears of those people. And then, those people themselves have now an opportunity through the gospel of remembrance 
to be reminded of who they are supposed to be in Christ Jesus and stop allowing themselves to be used by Satan. If you have once believed in the Lord Jesus, he has given you the power to cast out devils. Cast out the devil of strife. Cast out the demon of envy. Cast out the demon of jealousy from you. If there is something that you see in my life that is making you uncomfortable because you wish you had it, ask God is still in the business of giving. Don't let jealousy turn you into a zombie and a vampire and an evildoer. I may not preach this message next week, but I have preached it today. Take it as your last warning and cease from doing evil. When God has precious assignments for you to do, when God has called you, I know a man, whether I'm in the body or out of the body, I will not tell, at least not today. But he recently had visions where in a seraphim was speaking to him. Looking at him and giving him instructions of things to come. When people are enjoying such privileges in Christ, why should you then be subject only to rumors and gossip when you could be hearing what God is saying in his holy habitation? When God has people for you to prepare to receive, do you know the Bible says that when the world sees Jesus on the blue sky, many will come unto repentance and they will need you to hold their hands. God is doing a great work. He is bringing in the harvest. And it's looking for people who are rested, who will be able to give of the kingdom of God, which is righteousness, peace, and joy. But when you don't have peace, when you don't have joy, how can you give the kingdom? What you don't have, you cannot give. We are preparing ourselves because the Lord has preserved us from, for this work. You have such a privilege. Why are you a busy body when you can be busy harvesting? You are busy hindering. Let me tell you something. Make up your mind today that you will not be one that goes about speaking evil when Jesus went about doing good. Let your conversation be seasoned with salt. Don't let anybody's behavior or your assessment of their behavior cause you to speak guile. Your mouth was made for peace. The Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall see God. Make up your mind because Satan is recruiting He's recruiting and you are not meant for his army. Tell yourself, I will not worry. I will not be afraid. And I will not be offended. I will not worry. I will not be afraid. And I will not be offended. If you are neither of those things, where will Satan find you? The Bible says Satan came to Jesus and he found nothing in him. His disciples deserted him. And he still did not worry. Satan was like, oh, let's try something else. He was saying, Eli, Eli, my father, my father, where, where is your face? You see what I mean? And he was not afraid. He says, into your hand, I commit my spirit. And though those people that he came to save were the ones crucifying him, you would have expected for at least for him to be a little offended. But he says, Father, please, before you take my soul, forgive them for the excuse me, for they know not what they do. And then it was said of the Lord Jesus Christ that when Satan came for him, he found nothing in him. He did not find unbelief that makes people worry. He did not find fear that makes people afraid. And he did not find offense that makes people bitter. And Jesus slipped out of his hands because there was nothing to hold on to. Don't let the magnet of Satan find the metals of unbelief in you. Become unattractable to the enemy. If I were you, I would say it again. I will not worry. I will not be afraid. And I will not be offended. Because I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I am peace. And I am joy because my father made me so. And just for yours benefit, I am also Noah. I am rest. Hallelujah. Rooted, built, established. Can't go wrong with that. Let us partake of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in remembrance of him. I think I need to cut my hair more often. Praise the Lord.
Oh yeah, God is good. Okay, so one more thing that we're going to do tonight um, is I want you to keep an eye out for messages in the group. By the grace of God, we're having a... Uh, um, we, we're, we're inviting folks over for thanks, I mean, not thanks even, for Resurrection Sunday. Alrighty? So we're inviting people over for Resurrection Sunday, um, and the party is going to be hosted by us here, the Andersons. Alan's already eager to grill for us. You know, we, we told him just before service that we're going to be having a party, and was like, grilling, grilling, grilling. Oh yeah. And so if there's anything that you want to do as part of that, uh, please let us know ahead of time if possible so that we can you know make arrangements but if you get spontaneous on the day and you want to make a tray of salad or something you're welcome to do it you know us at communion house whatever we don't finish we take home Alrighty. and so because it's a resurrection uh sunday party feel free to invite folks we're going to invite some of our neighbors we're going to invite some of our other old friends invite friends and family let's um let's let's turn up and let's make it a good party and so the details are going to be announced later, but I believe my wife is singing 12, 1, thereabouts. Okay, well, the details, that's, they told me the details will be announced later. I'm trying to do the most right here. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, so prepare for it. And, um, and uh, for those who are unable to join us in our makeshift studio today, uh, make sure you come on Sunday. My wife is making rice by the grace of God. And I'm not going to be... Yes, I'm not, I'm not going to be calling any names, but some people have been messaging about the rice. At first, I was going to feel bad that they're not even telling me they miss me. They're telling me they miss the rice. I'm like, wow. Wow. Oh, they miss me too. Okay, well, your advocate has bailed you out. So the reality of it is that I know, and you know, uh, you can miss the rice, but I miss you and miss the fellowship that you bring. And so let's look forward to it. Let's make it a good party. Um, so again, what's happening is all the details will be communicated. Uh, there's, is there anything else that I am missing? I think that's about it. Alrighty. So you already heard the word. Don't worry. Don't be afraid. Don't be offended. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his mind. You're rooted, you're built, you're established. God bless you. Hallelujah. God is good. We're going to press on in our giving. We give God praise for this stirring up, I believe, a night of impartation. God is good. To our family online, several ways to give. Those of us that are here as well, you can make your checks payable to Communion House at P.O. Box 384, Swanee, Georgia. You can text to give at 678-929-2267, online at communion.house slash give. You can give also via the Church Center app, cash app, dollar sign, communion house, PayPal, at communion house, and Zelle, 404-369-9560. Let's give an obedience tonight and being thankful for this day. Again, that the Lord has made us rejoicing and being glad in it. Hallelujah. Lord, we give all glory unto you. We thank you for your name, for your word, O oh God, that implanted word for looking upon us in your favor in your mercy and your long suffering truly there is none like you O oh god knowing the plans for our lives to prosper us and not harm us to give us a hope in the future and expect an end for lord you have encouraged us and even as we know those that have called us poor, but you say unto us, indeed, you are rich. Father, you have granted unto us the life of luxury, of utmost comfort by the Holy Ghost, of not only life, but life more abundantly in you, O oh God. We cherish this. And Lord, you are our keeper. 
keep our hearts. Take our minds and control them, oh God. Make us one as you are one. Lord, we lift up these offerings unto you. Let them be found sweet smelling, without blemish, oh God. And Lord, we ask of thee as we turn over these offerings, these tithes unto you that you have commanded us, oh God, that you multiply in the way that only you can. For Lord, you see and know, Lord, what our needs are before we even utter them from our mouths, oh God. This is our hope in you and you alone. We declare again that all glory and honor belong to you. And we all said, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate the Lord again. God is good. And I want to uh, just remind us, let's continue to press into prayer. Wednesday nights have been off the chain. And uh, we'll be back at it tomorrow at 9 p.m. And brothers, don't forget, we shared this briefly on the men's call on Monday. We are scheduled for men's breakfast this Saturday. Be on the lookout for any updates uh, for that fellowship. But we're looking forward to that. Amen. God is good. Until we meet again, see y'all. Have a great night.